Last time we were looking at this passage, I passed over this phrase, in the Lord, way too quickly. We're going to devote this entire session to that one phrase. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. And there are two reasons why I'm going to devote an entire session to just one little phrase. One is that this occurs nine times in Philippians. That one phrase occurs nine times. Two, it's because we are prone to just pass over a phrase like this as Bible speak. Well, that's the way the Bible talks. I don't talk that way. Nobody talks that way. So we'll just pass over that and get to stuff that we we are more at home with. I think if we're not at home with it, that's a good reason to spend time on it. So, Father, I pray that as we ponder this phrase with this massive word, Lord, and this little phrase, in the Lord, you will guide us and show us what it means to do things in the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a quick survey just to get the possibilities before us of what this might mean. Drop down to verse 24. I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Sounds like, I mean, most people would read this to say trust in the Lord means that uh, the Lord is the, the basis of my confidence that I am going to be able to come there. That, that's the way I would be inclined to take it at my first read, at least. So this would be basis. Because of the Lord, I am confident that I am coming. Now we go back to the beginning, and we notice here in chapter 1, verse 14, most of the brothers having become confident, that's the same word as trust, in 224 that we just saw, having become confident in the Lord. So you might say, well, it's just, it's the very same thing, right? His confidence has its basis in the Lord. But notice here, it doesn't say he's confident that he's going to go anywhere or do anything. It's just a general confidence with the result that he's made confident, they're made confident by Paul's imprisonment, so they see Paul's amazing uh, boldness in prison, and they take heart and are much more bold themselves to speak the word without fear because of their confidence in the Lord. So it sounds like the Lord is the the source of their uh, confidence, he, the source of, of, of their the reality. He's real. The Lord is more real to them because of Paul. He's, he, he, it's the source of more helpfulness. They're more sure of his helpfulness. The, the source of triumph over their foes. So this in the Lord here, begetting this confidence, producing this boldness, is in the Lord as a, a more sure reality because of what they've seen in Paul and a more sure help and a more sure triumph And he's the source of all that. And that's probably implied in that word in. Now let's go to 229. This is Epaphroditus, the paragraph right after the one about Timothy. Receive him, receive Epaphroditus in the Lord. Oh my goodness, how different is this? This is not saying be confident in the Lord. This is saying do something in the Lord. Like here he comes, receive him in the Lord. Now that's, that's a... That's a way of talking that we almost never use, isn't it? And so I think we have much to learn here. What would that mean? Perhaps receive him in response to the Lord. It's the Lord sending him, not just Paul. The Lord has undertaken to send this man back to you. So in response to the Lord or receive him in conformity to the Lord. In other words, receive him the way the Lord would receive him. Let let the Lord shape the way you receive him. Or another possibility, or all of them together would be receive him in oneness 
with him in the Lord. So he's in the Lord and you're in the Lord. And so you have a sweet and deep and eternal oneness with each other. So whether it's in response to the Lord sending him, in conformity to the way the Lord would receive him, or because you are one with him, deeply in union with the Lord, think about what it would mean when he shows up to receive him, not the way the world would receive him. This is calling us to be shaped by a supernatural reality called the Lord. Now, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, we get an illustration that occurs three times in Paul. Rejoice. Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord. So, three times, I rejoice, or you should rejoice, in the Lord. And my inclination, and I think yours would be too, probably would be to say that uh, in him as the very object, wouldn't you say, object of our joy. I mean, it could be that he just means rejoice in response to the Lord, or rejoice in conformity to the Lord, or rejoice in reliance upon the Lord, and leave the object of the joy unspecified. I, I don't think that is the case, and not only does it, in the context following rejoice, suggest to me that he's the object of the joy, but you read this Remarkable word in chapter 3, verse 8. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So Jesus here is the object of the satisfying fellowship or union or knowing him. Two more. Therefore, my brothers, this is chapter 4, verse 2, 1 and 2, two times. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syndicate to agree in the Lord. So stand firm in the Lord in reliance on the Lord, in conformity. Formity, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) In conformity to the Lord. That is, be like Him no matter what the costs, and stand firm, and in fellowship with Him and with all those who are in Him. Don't be shaken in your unity with the Lord, your union with the Lord. And here, agree in the Lord. This harkens back to, what, 2, 2, and through 4, on how to be of one mind. Agree in the Lord. Probably all of those Agree in reliance upon the Lord. Agree in conformity to the Lord, the way the Lord would want you to. Agree in fellowship with the Lord. And of course, agree, Euodia and Syntyche, because you both are in the Lord. Amazing. Oh, if we thought more about that. With, as, as the Christians with whom we are arguing or upset or debating that we are profoundly in the Lord together. Now let's go back. So here we are spending an entire session on, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you. And we see now the possibilities here are much greater than simply that the Lord is the basis of my hope. That's true, but now it could be so much more. It could be, my hope is in expectation 
from the Lord. He's the one who's going to enable this to be fulfilled. My hope is in response to the Lord. I'm not sending him by some willy-nilly impulse that came into my mind. The Lord put this in my mind. It is, it is in response to the Lord that I hope to send him. I am sending him in conformity to the Lord. I'm trying to uh, send him in a way that honors the Lord. It conforms to the way the Lord would send him so that when you receive him, you can receive him in the Lord as sent from the Lord. And maybe one more, I am sending him in deference to the Lord, meaning if the Lord wills, he will come. And if he doesn't will, he won't come. I'm not acting as a sovereign independent agent here, I'm acting in reliance upon the Lord. And therefore I expect him to bring this to pass. If it comes to pass, I am trying to respond to his impulses for your sake. I'm trying to conform the sending to the way he would send. And I am totally deferential towards his sovereign rule. So my, my closing main point is don't fly over phrases in the Bible. As though they are throwaway phrases. They're not. Not like this. In the Lord carries tons of freight, and we need to reflect on it long enough, deeply enough, that our own way of thinking, way of feeling, and way of talking is shaped by it. Very often, how we talk spontaneously betrays more, shows more of what we really believe about reality than what we say when we're very, very carefully talking biblically. So let this inform the spontaneity of your language and your mind.